I would also particularly like to thank MIT for hosting us. They've done uh, an amazing job and have really gone above and beyond uh, helping us manage a, a large overflow crowd. Um, this program is going to be very exciting. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge our underwriters. Um, none of this would have been possible without the support of Irving House, who's been our prime underwriter, uh, and the support of Forest City. Um, so without further ado, I hope you enjoy the program, uh, and I hope if you are not already members of the Cambridge Historical Society, you'll consider joining. We are an independent nonprofit organization. We don't receive any support from tax, uh, the taxes or from any larger institutions. Uh, in your programs, you'll find a membership envelope. We'd be thrilled if you would consider it. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Steve Miller, who's going to tell you a little bit about Livable Streets, and uh, then we'll be hosted by Mayor Henrietta Davis. Thank you. The Livable Streets Alliance is an advocacy organization, it's about seven years old, that pushes for a more balanced transportation system that serves walkers, bicyclists, people in wheelchairs, as well as cars and transit and buses and the whole realm. And it's totally relevant that uh, we are co-sponsoring tonight, partly because Livable Streets is slightly modeled after a group called Urban Planning Aid, which you hopefully will hear a little bit about today, which is very instrumental as a organization fighting the highways that you're going to hear about uh, in the next series. So we want to also welcome you. Uh, we're also a nonprofit. If you want to join things, join us too. And uh, it's livablestreets.info, where you can see a whole lot of stuff. We do monthly uh, educational events, and such as this. And now, Mayor Davis. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this wonderful event and this wonderful series that the Cambridge Historical Society is hosting. Uh, I, I guess my, the first thing I need to do is say thank you to all those people who rescued my house. Uh, so, uh, uh, my husband and I live in a house that uh, m it, it doesn't look like on the map, which I saw tonight, would actually have been destroyed. It would have been next to the house that was destroyed. And, uh, I moved to Chestnut Street in 1967, and I was only dimly aware that these things were going on. And imagine my horror when I looked at the map tonight and saw how close I was to disaster. So uh, it's really wonderful to see all of you here this evening. And I, I've seen everyone welcome everyone else because it's a great alumni event. For anybody who doesn't know, the Inner Belt was going to be an eight-lane highway, and it was going to cut through the city, cut through Cambridge, uh, coming up Brookline Street and going to Elm, Brookline Elm, and on to Somerville, roughly the route, by the way, of the proposed urban ring. Um, and uh, thousands of homes would have been destroyed. Um, and tonight, we're fortunate enough to have three wonderful historians of actually what happened when and, uh, and how all these houses and all these neighborhoods were saved when Frank Sargent and others determined that the highways weren't the only way to get around town. So it is first my pleasure to introduce Tunny Lee. Uh, I remember Tunny Lee because I s took some courses at uh, MIT myself, and, I, and he was a, a very important transportation planner back when I was taking classes. Uh, he's a senior lecturer and professor and emeritus at MIT. He was the head of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT from 1986 to 1990. He studies the experience of neighborhood and city, city planning in Boston and Hong Kong with a special interest in high-density urban settings. He is the former Chief of Planning and Design at the Boston Redevelopment Authority and the former Deputy Commissioner for the Massachusetts Division of Capital Planning and Operations. At the early stages of the opposition to the inner belt, Lee worked with Fred Salvucci, also here in our panel, and other, planals, other planners to provide technical assistance to the neighborhood groups. Tony, please come forward and share your wisdom. Well, thank you, Henrietta, and uh, welcome, everybody. And um, I was involved with this a very short time, but I do see some familiar faces, and I know that Bob and Fred have been um, um, welcoming this, this group. Um, I, this starting slide, of course, is Frank Sargent on TV on February 11, 1970, announcing a moratorium on the highways. And, um, that was the beginning of the end and the start of a second phase, which uh, Fred will talk about some more, which really changed the, um, um, the, nat 
the city. So by 1972, uh, it's finally done, and maybe Fred could talk about how that was one of the increment, incremental decisions by the um, BTPR. The, um, that's, um, that's a distorted picture of Brookline Elm on the, Brookline, <laughs> on the right. But it, it's, um, this, I'm, I'm the historian in this group because Fred and Bob were deeply involved I want to go through that the struggle was very long, and it always appeared up to the time it was stopped that that highway was going to be built uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. So first, the first safe was at the, um, in, from 1948 when the highway plan was announced to about 1965, 1969, where the battle was really uneven. I mean, a raid on one side where the federal the uh, federal government, the state government, and uh, um, uh, uh, Cambridge establishment, and the universities. And then about 1965, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, there was a veto uh, uh, that Cambridge and uh, several other communities got to, to halt the, um, uh, the inner belt and the, and the highway. Uh, but that was repealed in 1965, and at that point, there was a sort of change in, um, in intensity. Uh, grassroots organizing became very intense, and uh, professionals, like academics, began to join in this fight, and I think Bob will talk more about that. And part of the first phase was really seeking alternative routes, that is, it was inevitable. The, 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 uh, all the newspaper headlines, all the people we talked to in the city, everywhere was, it was inevitable, we just have to find the best route. However, the best route always came back to Brookline Elm. And about 1969, um, the, uh, uh, the, the organizers and the uh, profes uh, professionals uh, formed uh, Urban Planning Aid, and they began to expand the political arena and getting the, the, the region involved, and also in engaging Tip O'Neill and Senator Kennedy in Washington, D.C. In 1970, there was a very dangerous moment when um, uh, uh, Nixon was elected president, and uh, Governor Volpe went to Washington as Secretary of Transportation. Um, by 1971, the um, the highway had been stopped, or the moratorium on the highways, and the BTPR was underway. And from that, after that, we had the transit expanded, the Southwest Corridor, an interstate transfer, and the Big Dig. All these came out of that, that struggle. So um, part of the, the elements that were involved in, um, in this uh, uneven battle was that there was a lot of expert opinion and models and uh, origin and destination studies costing millions and millions of dollars, which said that the road was both locally needed and necessity. And, then, and the planning board of Cambridge proposed Brookline Elm as the, the, less, the least harmful alternative. There was lots of federal dollars involved, both highway and urban renewal. Um, and the, um, the academics, uh, you know, uh, our, our place right here, and my department of urban studies and planning, were doing other things other than worrying about things like um, the highways. Over they're worrying about highways. They're thinking how they may be more aesthetic, or the view from the road, as I remember, from uh, was more important than the view or, or view under the road, which is like. <laughs> and at that point. The planning board, the development authority, the Cambridge Civic Association, the Chamber of Commerce, and I think at that point, the League of Women Voters as well, MIT, Harvard, all supporting um, uh, essentially Brookline Elm. Now, the, the, um, on the other side, what was at stake was you know, uh, 1,300 families, three to 5,000 people, uh, about 100 businesses. 
Uh, the neighborhood that was threatened there was one of the most unusual diverse neighborhoods. In 1965, as you all remember, was the, the, uh, uh, the, the racial issues were very heavy in the city of Lawson, everywhere in the country, but that neighborhood had a, I think, 10% uh, black residents, Portuguese, you know, ethnic whites, Italian, and, you know, scattering of students. And it was um, a very, um, um, I think a, it, was, it was very, it was a low income working class neighborhood, but it was a very stable neighborhood. Um, and the important thing at that point, the city council was very much uh, the, 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 um, the one city uh, organization that was holding out. Uh, they saw too, too well firsthand what was going to do to the city. And the uh, Senator, I think, uh, Representative Toomey and Senator McCann from Cambridge uh, managed to uh, uh, have a veto pass in the legislature to um, give this, uh, Cambridge, Boston, Brookline, a few others, a veto power over any piece of highway that went through that. And that was used for, for many years to hold off the, um, the belt. Uh, I think Fred might also talk about that. And part of the reason the veto came in was because of the turnpike, because uh, the, the turnpike wanted to build its road before the inner belt got built. But eventually, they're going to build the inner belt. So the, um, 1948 was the first the, uh, the, 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 the highway plan was to connect the interstate system. So the inner belt was part of the interstate system. So going from Florida to Maine, uh, from 95 up around 695 and then on 95 to Maine. And also, as a, uh, somebody said, this is a wheel with all the spokes headed for, for the city. And the, um, the plan for the inner belt was to cut through. Anyway, you can see the, uh, the route through Cambridge. And um, this is uh, a report that was done by a city agency and in 1950. And I first saw it, I thought it might be the highway um, agency. Uh, it turned out to be the uh, Cambridge Planning Board. It's about 1950. I, I think it was, the, you know, the, the, the time was Boston and Cambridge was in the tail end of a very long depression. Uh, manufacturing had left the town. People were leaving. The suburbs were opening up. And the city was suffering a tremendous um, loss of jobs, loss of residents. And it was really felt that uh, highways and urban renewal were the, the, the solution to this. Um, so the, the first time the, 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 the inner belt through Cambridge was proposed was in 1948. And the first proposal was really down, I can't get to see this. Is it OK? OK. Uh, if you can see this, this is Lee Street, City Hall's right there. Uh, that was a 1948 plan. Uh, you can bet it didn't last very long. Uh, I think uh, a few quiet words from the president of Harvard would have killed that. But by 19, uh, uh, into the 50s and 60s, Cambridge. Uh, uh, planning Board and the Renewal Authority came up with an alternate, which was the Brookline Elm route. And there was uh, urban renewal projects projected for Cambridgeport, something called Houghton, which is now Riverside, and the Donnelly Field area. So they, they posed the Lee Street route versus the Brookline Elm route. The, um, this is Central Square, and, uh, and even this, which is a, I always found this a wonderfully a sunny day with a few cars, the road is nice and clean, uh, it's um, quiet, uh, 
And very nicely, they left the churches, uh, and they left a few buildings around. Uh, and uh, and uh, there was a big, you know, selling piece. The the planning board uh, went to. They, they said, uh, "What a wonderful thing was going to do for Central Square." Uh, you know, the, uh, the more shoppers going to come in, and more. Uh, more, uh, more people would be able to come to, to Central Square. Of course, the people who were under the highway uh, were not going to benefit from that. So it, this is the 1957 planning board map, um, but it's eventually it was a 1960 plan. And what it shows is really, uh, really uh, significant because the Brookline Elm route becomes a boundary between industry and MIT and the rest of the city. It would have destroyed all the housing on the, um, the, the right-hand side of the road and left a few little, uh, uh, little uh, spots. And it would have gone right through um, two neighborhoods. I mean, neighborhoods that were defined by the, um, by the planning board itself now, the, the, um, the 1962 report has really beautiful graphics. <laughs> you know, the red line is just a gorgeous red line cutting like a surgical knife coming through the city of Cambridge. And what they did, of course, not show was what actually happened under the road. And the second slide, which Gavin found for me. I, if anybody knows the source, I would love to know the source of this. But they went through the, um, say, what buildings were going to be demolished and what buildings would be otherwise adversely affected. If you look carefully in the, it, I, can't, I can't see the laser pointer, so, but if you look at the little green buildings, maybe I can. Look at the loop. There's three buildings left. Another green, two buildings, and uh, Henrietta. My house. Your house didn't matter if it wasn't taken, right? You can imagine not just those uh, screwy ones, which is of one building left in the middle of the ramp, but all the houses around it. Uh, you know, what would happen to the neighborhood would have been uh, staggering. And in the report, of course, it's uh, very kind of stark figures. 501 residential, 117 retail. That hardly ever talked about. Good thing for Central Square. And 1,500 households. And for the city as a whole, much more than that. But even Somerville has 500 and almost 590 uh, residences. And in, in the report, it's interesting, we just went through it recently. And there was just no talk of who lived there. It was, uh, then this is also from the report. And it's, um, um, so in, in, those, in that time, uh, the, the, the highway uh, uh, takings would pay for your house, but not even for relocation. And there's a little thing, the, the fourth line, Low-income families may experience some hardship. And then the rest of it talks about urban renewal and the, uh, how urban renewal could pay for some of that, can be placed the housing, and so on. So this is Elm and Broadway. And we just took a little thing of, um, it would have run down one side. It would have left the school, the school that became the Cambridge Port School, on the left-hand side up there on one side, and I think the Wellington School on the other, and would left St. Mary's Church, and taken out the schools, the parish, but left the buildings. But by that time, um, all these promises were much less um, convincing. 
we'd already, by 1960, we'd already seen what happened to the West End. Um, by 1960, middle, we saw what the turnpike did. And this is Hudson Street, but I think F Fred will remember his grandmother's house in Brighton. Um, and the, 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 the displacement was brutal. You, you all know the history of the West End, and I don't need to go into that. But by that time, uh, all those promises of renewal and relocation housing and so on were pretty much pretty hollow. That's, this is McDonald's up there on the right. But even that doesn't begin to convey, you know, I, I, when I first did this collage, oh, my friend did the collage, it was at the, um, it was in color and had a nice blue sky, and I said, no, that's not gonna <laughs> Because by then we knew what the central area looked like and what it really looked like underneath. So the, um, the, the first, the, the in uh, August 86, 1965, the veto was repealed, and all of a sudden Cambridge is left uh, facing the... Um, but at that point, I think Neighbors United, uh, Fred and Bob Goodman and Danny Klubach and many, many, Cody Feldman, uh, organized the Cambridge Committee on the Inner Belt and hooked up with um, the Neighbors United and the parishes. I think it was Father McManus, who got in touch with the committee, and that began to change the nature of the fight. And um, um, the, the committee and, and the, uh, and, and the uh, Neighbors United presented the Portland Albany to the city council. Uh, MIT opposes the Portland Albany, citing national defense that would be taken over by the commies. Um, and, you know, by March 66, uh, Sargent makes his final decision on the Brookline Elm route. And there were attempts to alleviate this, this, this problem. Um, this is the Architecture Forum article uh, showing the, the architects collaborative. Uh, uh, that, uh, by that time, the, the, the DPW said, okay, we can depress the road. Uh, although uh, the, the technical difference is immense. But TAC was hired to uh, show how you could um, make it um, livable. Um, the problem, of course, I think at a public meeting, I think Bob and maybe some others asked TAC, uh, did you take into account the extra cost to build over the highway? No. Uh, are there funds available for this kind of construction? There will be. And that also quickly left over. So this is the, um, uh, I think the, I guess it's still the CCIB and the uh, organizers uh, propose uh, the alternates to the Brookline Elm route. And MIT went nuts. It's a, it was, and that, quickly changed. So again, it was really pretty inevitable that it would be built. So it changed the nature of, of the fight. I think instead of finding alternatives, it became a battle to stop the highways altogether. And that required uh, joining with, um, with other groups in the city. And um, the, at that point, I think a uh, very important document at that point, but urban planning aid was a critique of transportation planning in Boston. It was giving ammunition to the, to the um, um, community groups of a rationale and a carefully thought out analysis of the, the highway that could be used to argue not only in front of the, the state, but also to convince other people. And by that point, Harvard MIT faculty has joined in, um, 528 signed a petition uh, I, th I think the O'Neill and Kennedy joins in. So th the long struggle, I bring you up to about there. And um, 
I think Bob would talk about expanding the political arena, the danger and opportunity in 1970, the stopping and the replanning the highway, planning the transportation system, and then 73 and later, Fred will talk about how that became a wholly different transportation system, a wholly different city. Um, I leave you with some, you may recognize some of these people. Um, that's Father Corrigan, that's Jim Morey, that's Al Kramer, that's Barney Frank, and Chuck Turner. There are many, many others. I think, Fred, I don't know if you've put all the names of people together, but it took th hundreds and thousands of people to make this happen. And uh, I was very proud to be a part of it in a little way. And, um, and I want now to, to just turn this over to Bob. I get to introduce you to Bob, um, but first, uh, so many of you in this room are heroes and heroines in this fight, and many who will be speaking later on, but there are two that I wanted to call out. One who isn't with us uh, is Justin Gray, who is a planner for the city of Cambridge, and actually he hired me to be a, a neighborhood planner in Cambridge, and um, his influence was really important uh, in leading the city, as was Mayor Barbara Ackermans, and I understand she led the city on a horse. I don't know that I'll get that opportunity, uh, but I think uh, we all know that how important it was to have so many of you involved. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Goodman. Bob received his degree in architecture from MIT. He's Emeritus Professor of Environmental Design at Hampshire College and also taught urban planning and architecture at MIT, University of California, Berkeley, and Columbia University. Mr. Goodman was the founder and the first president of Urban Planning Aid which you've heard about, which provided professional planning to help low-income communities, and his work included helping community activists argue the case against the inner belt at various government forums. He's the author of After the Planners, an attack on the ways in which architects and planners contributed to the destruction of neighborhoods and failed to provide for people's needs. Mr. Goodman also wrote The Luck, of Bi the Luck Business, The Devastating consequences, consequences and Broken Promises of America's Gambling Explosion and The Last Entrepreneurs, America's Regional Wars for Jobs and Dollars. He's currently completing Joyride, Reinventing American Transportation. Bob Goodwin. Goodman, <laughs> come forward. Uh, first thing I want to say is that everything that Tony said was absolutely true, <laughs> especially the things he said about me. Uh, <clears throat> But I, I also want to acknowledge uh, the work that Justin Gray did, who has uh, helped us in so many ways. I wish he was still here. Um, he was an invaluable person in all the efforts to stop these highways, not just this highway, the Inner Belt Highway, but also the Southwest Expressway that was supposed to uh, connect to it in Boston, going through Roxbury and the South End. Uh, <clears throat> It occurred to me, you know, my, my daughter Julia is here this evening, and I just realized that she was about two or three years old when all this happened. She now has three boys, and uh, I realized she probably is maybe learning about most of this for the first time, and maybe some of you are as well. So I try to be as accurate as I can. I'm curious, though, uh, I'd like to know how many of you were either living in the path or now live in the path of where this highway was or would have been affected by it. That is, you might have lived in the, in the shadow of it. Either this highway or some other highway in Boston, Southwest Expressway maybe. Okay, so it's a friendly audience. I want them to, <laughs> I want, I want them to make sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to say, you know, when I first heard the term inner belt, uh, to tell you how much I knew, I thought it was some kind of uh, uh, clothing accessory or something like that. But um, <clears throat> I, learned, I had to learn, I had to catch up very quick, and people like uh, Tunney and, uh, and Fred helped me with that. Um, I'd like to talk about three things, actually, seri more seriously. Um, first, I want to talk about how uh, the Inner Bell fight 
really changed uh, transportation planning in the Boston area and what brought that about. And I'd like to talk about my, <clears throat> my personal involvement in this fight and how it transformed my own ideas about uh, transportation and urban planning. And the third thing I'd like to talk about just briefly, I won't go on too long hopefully, is what kind of transportation uh, transformations uh, would be uh, important for the future. What did we learn from the past? And what, where could we go in the future? Um, so getting to the first point about how the Interbelt transformed transportation planning in Boston. Uh, in the 1960s, as Tony alluded to, the, not just was there all of this transportation planning going on, the inter interstate highways, but also urban renewal. So there were massive relocations, massive changes in the face of cities. And one of the mottos that the planners uh, like to use, they used it in Boston, I've seen it used in other cities, was uh, planning with people. That was uh, very important, it was front and center. Uh, what it really meant was uh, finding the people who agreed with your ideas and then planning with them. So they were planning with people. It wasn't dishonest. It was a truthful thing to do. Uh, at the time, I, I was a graduate student in planning at MIT and also a teaching assistant. And I had volunteered to help a group of people who were fighting dislocation just across the river from Harvard, something called a North Harvard Street project, which was next to the business school. It's an interesting project, actually. It was supported. The people who were being uh, kicked out of their homes were supported by unusual groups. Uh, on one hand, they were supported by the John Birch Society. And I think most of you know who that is, an ultra-conservative, I think even beyond the Tea Party. Uh, and uh, SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, on, on the left. I don't, think there was a, I don't think there was any project in the United States that had these two having meetings together and, and supporting uh, this effort. Anyway, I, uh, Tony and Fred got in touch with me about that time and started asking me if I would get involved in this uh, inner belt issue. And it wasn't... Uh, as it turned out later on, we found out it wasn't just the inner belt, it was the Southwest Expressway, and we found out there was a lot of money that would be brought to the city, and there were a lot of people uh, that wanted to see the money come here. It would be jobs and make, make a lot of sense, and politicians wanted to bring the money here. Um, and people who were opposing, when we started opposing this and coming up with alternatives, we were accused of being against progress, uh, against jobs, against the economy. I mean, everything you could imagine that's bad. Uh, and the only real support we got at the beginning, especially, was from people in, in the neighborhoods. Uh, and as we got more and more into this, uh, what we realized is that we were doing something and filling a need that hadn't been uh, looked at, and that is there were low income for the most part, and even in some cases middle income communities that were being planned for by official agencies, uh, and their needs were not really being taken into account. Uh, and so we decided to form this organization, Urban Planning Aid, where there were planners and architects and sociologists and others who would try to provide uh, alternatives. Uh, people like Chet Hartman and uh, Dennis Blackett, um, uh, Lisa Petey, Jim Morey has already been mentioned, Dan Klubach who's here tonight. Um, and one of the main goals that UPA had, and I had to look this up because we had a sheet that had all our goals listed, but one of the main goals, and I have it here, it said, uh, <clears throat> was community self-determination. And I'm quoting here, full participation of local community members, including those at the lowest social and economic levels. 
uh, Dennis Blackett, who incidentally, who lived in Cambridge, we were just in touch with. He was uh, director of a uh, housing development company in Boston at the time. He was a critical player. Dennis uh, is an African-American who now lives in Florida. And he had helped us. Uh, he, he'd been trained as an architect and engineer and helped us in some of the alternative designs for the highways. Tony mentioned, I think, the, I don't know if you talked about it specifically, uh, an alternative along uh, was in Portland and Albany Street and then along the railroad. These were closer to MIT. The railroad one, as Tony mentioned, uh, <clears throat> we were going to destroy American civilization. I mean, uh, this, I, don't know, I, I mean, they had people from the Defense Department coming to meetings. Uh, <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, you know, that uh, the communists were just at our doorstep and if we put that highway there, uh, all hell would broke, break loose. Um, but anyway, the interesting thing about this to me is when I t talk to some people now, and I, I've often heard this, is that something like this would never happen again. Uh, that values have changed, and uh, planners and uh, politicians don't do this sort of thing anymore. And I think that actually, for the most part, it's true. Uh, values have changed, but I think the reason they've changed is not because the planners and the politicians suddenly came up with new ideas. I think it's because people in these neighborhoods forced them into these new values. Uh, they didn't have these, you know, it wasn't that they read about it in books and came up with new theories. Uh, they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And I include myself, you know, I learned a lot in this process. I thought the basic highway idea was pretty good. All we had to do is find an alternative. I thought it was, you know, Brookline Elm Street was a disaster. So if we could just put it along the railroad tracks, let's say, or just in this industrial area, why not? Uh, you know, and we started to get, talk to people, not just in Cambridge, but Jamaica Plain, Roxbury, Somerville, even Brookline, uh, because it was going to go through a little corner of Brookline. And the more we talk to people, the more we say, why are we having the highway all together? Why are we doing this? Uh, and a lot of people said, why don't we have public transportation? Gee, that's a good idea. You know, I know that sounds funny now, and it, you know, no one would think that's a silly idea. But at the time, you know, the idea that you didn't need the highways and you could just substitute public transportation, that was uh, anathema. People didn't take that seriously, at least in, in the planning, planning world. And so these values changed. The more people opposed it and the more successful they became, the more it changed. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I just mentioned that, um, you know, there's still fights to be had. There's still people pushing some of these ideas. Let me, let me just give you one example that I came across. I happened to get a uh, sort of inside paper from a lobbying group. Uh, the lobbying group is called the American Highway Users Conference. Sounds like highway users. It's not really the highway users. This is funded by General Motors, Ford, Asphalt, and, and Concrete Companies. It's the Highway Providers Conference. Uh, people who profit from highways. Anyway, this, I'm just going to quote what they're saying. They, they said, this is, a document came out in 1999, and it said that their goal should be to, uh, def I'm quoting now, defend against smart growth, fight against government policies that would shift some highway funds to public transportation and air quality improvement bike paths, and other alternative transportation projects. Okay? 1999. 1999. Many, many years after the interbell fight. So this is, this is what we're still up against. Uh, and uh, this is what communities are still going to have to face. I mean, we're fortunate here in Cambridge that it didn't happen, but there are other places in this country and other parts of the world where this is still going on. 
Let me give you just another example. This goes back to the 1960s when they were actually pushing these uh, interstate highways. And as part of the interstate program, one of the ways it gets funded, and most of you probably know this, but I'll just repeat it, is that a percentage of your, every time you fill up your car at the gas station, percentage of that tax, a major percentage of that tax goes to build and maintain highways. So here's what the Asphalt Institute, which was a lobbying group for the asphalt industry said. And again, I'm quoting, so they wanted to establish, quote, a self-perpetuating cycle. Again, quote, it said that Americans should be encouraged to drive longer distances to automatically affect the rise in annual fuel consumption per vehicle. And this would increase gas tax revenues to perpetuate the cycle. Now put that in the context of some of the things you're hearing about the environment and oil crisis and other things like that. At the time that people were fighting this highway in Cambridge, the Boston Globe initially, through their transportation editor, a guy named Abe Plotkin, I don't know if that name rings a bell for some of you, some of the old timers at May. This is what he said. He was basically poking fun at these silly people in the neighborhood who were organizing. He called it cloud nine yearning. That was his term. And again, again I quote, the great American love affair with the automobile is undiminished. Boston and Cambridge cannot willy nilly cut off the arteries through which their lifeblood must flow. Uh, they cut off the arteries, but they didn't die, I guess. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the interesting thing is that after a lot of opposition by neighborhood people, uh, and after help by some of the politicians in Washington, I remember we went down, talked to uh, Tip O'Neill, Ted Kennedy, um, who was the senator, Leverett Saltonstall. Uh, actually, I remember being in uh, Tip O'Neill's office, and uh, he said, I want you to call, Tip O'Neill said, I want you to call Leverett Saltonstall and ask him what he thinks. So we called, we were sitting in the office, called Leverett Saltonstall, and he said to me, uh, is Tip in favor of it? <laughs> I said, in favor of what? He says, you know, in stopping the highway. I said, yeah, he seems to be. He says, well, anything Tip says is okay with me. <laughs> That's, a, that's how policy gets made. <laughs> <coughs> he was an important guy, Tip O'Neill. <coughs> and actually, as I said before, the, the people who really made the difference were people in the neighborhood and some of the community leaders, uh, uh, neighborhood people like Ann Steve Benfield. I think she's going to be speaking here next panel. Should be really interesting. Uh, Father Paul McManus. Uh, Reverend Kenneth Hughes, a uh, number of other religious and community leaders. I'd like to just quote a few excerpts from some of these folks because uh, a woman, Barbara Cohn, at the Cambridge Civic Association went and interviewed some people along Brookline Elm Street route. And some of you may actually remember these people. Uh, so uh, <coughs> this was, uh, I'm probably not pronouncing his name right, uh, but anyway, it's uh, Antonio Sorio. Uh, if I have to get out, I'll probably have to give up my upholstery business. W when I came here, both the house and the barn were a wreck. I couldn't get a bank to give me a mortgage. They said the neighborhood was a dump. I have completely rebuilt it all. Now I have my life all set. Nice home, nice shop, nice neighborhood. They want to take it all away. I hate the thought of more cars in Cambridge. I hate it. But this road, once you build it, it will be jammed. Don't need a traffic planner to tell you that. It will spoil the whole section of the city to have this road. The people in Washington don't care. Then there was uh, Peter Minettis. I tend to be despondent in many ways about this road, but it is much harder for my wife. My wife is on the verge of a nervous breakdown. The tension has built up to the point where she said that if she stayed any longer, she'd crack up, ask her doctor. 
From what I learned in civics, I thought America would not operate this way. The government did not work hard to choose the right route, and they handled us badder, badly. Their minds were made up. The choice of where a road should go should be openly discussed and people should be listened to. There's no need for this road. I'll do anything to stop it. I'll go down kicking. Then there was also um, uh, Sarah, uh, what's her name? Oh yeah, Sarah uh, Radnovsky. I asked the man what I would get for my house. He shook his head and all he said was, it's substandard. What he's trying to tell me is I shouldn't expect too much. They can tell, they can call me substandard and I guess I am compared to some, but I'm not substandard to my friends and neighbors. I know every customer. I'm selling to the little kids now and I knew their mothers when they were little kids. I knew their grandmothers when they were young mothers. I'm invited to all the baby showers, the christenings. I'm Jewish and we just had a bar mitzvah for my boy Sheldon and all the neighbors came. We are part of everybody's family and they are part of ours. And then there was another woman in the store, in, in uh, Sarah's store. The woman said, I've been here all my life and now they tell me I've got to go. Go where, I'd like to know. The only way I'll move is if they drag me out. It gives you some sense of uh, what people felt in that neighborhood and how attached they were. Uh, Tony mentioned Jim Morey. Now, I, I like to single Jim out because, unfortunately, Jim passed away some, some years ago. But Jim, who later became uh, director of UPA, was really a major player. And Tony mentioned the critique of the whole Boston area transportation system, and Jim was really in charge of that, but he comes from an interesting background. Jim was a systems engineer, and he was uh, an associate head at MITRE Corporation. MITRE Corporation, as some of you may know, does uh, research for the uh, military industry. And he decided to leave. He decided he didn't want to use his skills to do military work. He working with the American Friends Service Committee. And by the way, the American Friends Service Committee actually gave us our first grant at, at UPA. Uh, and I met Jim when he was holding seminars for other systems engineers. Uh, and they were interested in figuring out ways that they could use their skills for different purposes than the military. And they saw UPA and the kind of neighborhood struggles that were going on around planning issues as one way that they could use their skills. Uh, and so he, he was really in charge of this uh, transportation critique. We, we contributed to it, but he really pulled it together. And I think it had a major influence on the system that actually got built, the, the shift from highways to uh, uh, public transit in the Boston area. So let me try to end up on the, this last point I mentioned. Uh, what kind of uh, transportation transformations might we be hoping for in the future, or at least ones that I would hope for? Uh, as we know, not only did, were highways stopped in Cambridge, uh, they were stopped in Boston, they were stopped in New Orleans, San Francisco, uh, Baltimore, uh, many other cities, Milwaukee, um, and now there are still groups fighting to not just stop plans, but for the most part, try to tear things down. I, I heard just the other day they're in the process of uh, just about to tear down the viaduct over in Jamaica Plain. Uh, so today, the major emphasis seems to be on fuel efficient cars, you know, hybrid cars, electric cars, and that's seems to be, at least for some people, the answer to a major transportation problem. What I think is not recognized is that after the oil crisis in the 1970s, when we got more fuel efficient cars than we ever had before, and they got even more and more fuel efficient, 
people drove more than ever. We didn't reduce the amount of oil we used. Highways got more crowded. Uh, pollution increased. Uh, things didn't, you know, uh, communities sprawled out over the land a lot more. We, we created more environmental problems. So the idea that we're going to solve the problem through some automobile technology, new power systems, is uh, really a myth. And I think, unfortunately, there are many planners who still believe that's uh, possible. Uh, I think we need greener cars. I'm, I'm not trying to make an argument against green cars. I think it makes a lot of sense. But if we don't rejigger the whole system, it's not going to do us much good. I think the answer for the future is obvious, a more balanced system, more public transit, better use of airplanes, especially using them for long flights rather than short flights where they pollute more and use more fuel. We need high-speed trains. Uh, and mostly, we need to just become less dependent on cars. Now, it's interesting. We traveled on trains in the 1930s faster than the fastest train we have. This is in America. Faster than the fastest train we have now, the, uh, what is it called, the Amtrak Acela. It's called a high-speed train. It averages about 75 miles an hour. So we need to do a lot better than that. You know, Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan has uh, 1 16th per capita income of the United States. They recently built two high-speed train lines. Uh, I think if Uzbekistan can point the way, we might be able to follow. <laughs> it, we certainly need an economy and jobs, uh, but we don't need the economy and jobs of the 20th century. I think we need it uh, of the 21st century. And I don't think the automobile industry and becoming dependent on the automobile and the automobile jobs are going to be very important for the 21st century because we can see countries all over the world moving in a very different direction. If we keep moving backwards, uh, it's not going to do us much good. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we can move in this future direction. And I think the kind of system we need is that it was actually pretty much stated by the people who were facing the inner belt many years ago. It's not rocket science, it's not anything new, and I think they had something and we ought to listen to what they said. Thank you very much. Changing, don't rest on your laurels. I told them how we were eliminating parking and adding bike parking and more pedestrian routes. And they applauded for me at the end. So, uh, you know, I think, I think there is hope. And uh, the idea that we would have less parking maybe is even penetrating the New England Parking Association. Uh, so our last speaker this evening is Fred Salvucci. And uh, for me, it's, uh, I would be inclined to say, who needs to introduce Fred? Uh, because Fred, to me, is the transportation, transportation planner of big ideas of the century in, uh, in the Boston area. And uh, uh, I'll give you the details of Fred, but I'm sure you have all known of, of him uh, and been inspired by him. He's the sen senior lecturer and senior research associate in civil engineering at MIT. He's worked as a civil engineer specializing in transportation with a particular interest in infrastructure, urban transportation, public transportation, and institutional development in decision making. He served as transportation advisor to Mayor Kevin White between 70 and 74, and then as Massachusetts Secretary of Transportation under Michael Dukakis between 1975 and 78, and again from 1983 to 1990. In those roles, he participated in much of the transportation planning and policy formulation uh, in the Boston urban area and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the past 35 years, uh, with a particular emphasis on the expansion of the transit system and the development of fin the financial and political support for the Central Artery Tunnel Project. Working with Tony Lee, Mr. Salvucci provided technical assistance to community groups. Fred, come and speak with us this evening. Thank you. This is technologically challenging. This is, this is very high tech. 
to advance to the other. Right, you, you have it's, to point it's which one? The, the right hand. Right. The, this one. Yeah. And I pointed that way. I pointed point here. <laughs> okay. We'll see if it can work. Uh, a couple of things I'd say. First of all, I really appreciate all of you for pulling this forum together. This, this whole movement was an extremely important part of uh, many of our lives, certainly including me. Uh, Bob, talking about his daughter, reminded me that uh, when my son Guido was born, uh, I was uh, I was at a meeting. <laughs> I think in Danny Klubach's house with Dennis Blackett. <laughs> My wife was home and said, get home early tonight. I think it's time. <laughs> and uh, I gave Dennis a ride home to his house. And there was some other point we had to finish talking about. And my wife called Joan Blackett and said, is he there? And she said, oh my god. <laughs> so I got home and took Marianne to the hospital. And Guido was born <laughs> a few hours later. <laughs> Uh, kind of irresponsible of me, uh, <laughs> embarrassed to say, but it, it, this really was embedded in our, in our lives in, a, in an incredibly personal way. Um, the, uh, I have a presentation that I'll skip through because some of it is redundant with what's been said, and there's so much to say here that uh, and a lot of people in this room have a lot to add. We'll never sort of cover this whole subject. Uh, but I wanted to add something that's not here uh, that I just saw in a presentation uh, at the Lincoln Land Institute a couple of weeks ago by uh, a planner named Park, I'm forgetting his first name now, who is part of the grounding of an elevated highway in Minnesota, or someplace west of Newton, you know, the far west, right? <laughs> Uh, and he had a quote that was astounding to me, and I had never heard it before, from Henry Ford uh, in the 1920s saying, we will solve the problems of the city by leaving the cities behind us. Uh, and the problems we're dealing with, the problems we had some success with, some real success, I think, on the inner belt, are very deeply embedded, and they've been here uh, and cultivated by very powerful institu institutions for the better part of the last century. Uh, if you can imagine that statement, uh, the American economy at that point in time uh, had probably reached the position already of being the strongest economy in the world, overwhelmingly because of what happens in cities, because of the interaction of people, because of what the economists now are belatedly discovering and calling agglomeration effects, uh, the heart of the reason that this country grew economically is cities. Uh, and it's always tempting for engineers. I can say bad things about civil engineers because I are one too. Uh, we like to take a problem and isolate it. And it's very tempting to say the city is messy. Why don't we go do something somewhere else where we can control the whole environment? That's, that's deeply embedded in a way of thinking that Ford's statement indicates, but think about what, at this point, almost 100 years of that attitude uh, coming from primary industries has done to the politics of the United States and to the land use uh, decision making. So I agree with everything that Tony and Bob said and the point that Bob was making about how if we're serious about saving the planet, it's got to be a lot about a lot more than better cars, even though better cars is part of it. We need less cars, not just better cars. Uh, and, and, and we really need to shift the lifestyle. But it's very hard to put this genie back in the bottle once you've got a whole land use pattern that's been developed. The cities saw themselves, when Eisenhower started the interstate in 1956, the cities demanded that the interstates come in uh, it, you know, the, the rewritten history is the evil suburbanites invaded the cities. It's the opposite. And, and I think the documents that Tony was showing you, this Cambridge City Planning Board celebrating uh, urban renewal to tear out whole neighborhoods in the city that are wonderful places to live, were then and are today, uh, blighted. I mean, the indication for a blighted house was if you're in the bathroom, 
if the toilet had one of the overhead hoppers, that got a chick, that got you into substandard so they could knock your house down. Uh, you know, we had one of those in my house. <laughs> we were just lucky nobody came and checked, you know? Uh, so this kind of nuttiness uh, was invited in by the city governments because they were terrified that the economy was following the cars out to the suburbs and if they, the roads didn't come in, the cities would die. Uh, I don't think they were right, but as Tony said, if you put yourself in their shoes, the economy was in real trouble in the cities and they were doing very bad, very desperate things. Uh, so th this problem uh, is deeply embedded and it doesn't go away quick. It's not going to change quick. If we're serious, we have to stay engaged in a process of change. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go through these slides if I can make this thing work. Um, now, I'd like you to think uh, that I uh, sit around reading Kierkegaard. <laughs> It's the right image. You know, I'm teaching at MIT now. Uh, uh, some of you know that I actually lifted this from the back of a Salata tea bag. It's a source of great wisdom. But I, I think it's a terrific, uh, a terrific way of thinking about things because looking back, we can see patterns. But at the time, we were sort of going to these meetings and working with Father McManus and Anthony Benfield and hundreds and hundreds of people that we worked with in this process, it was very uncertain what was going to come next. We were really up against, as Tony put it, uh, most of the establishment was against us. And uh, so how we perceived it then is different than the way we may reconstruct it looking back. And that's an important thing to remember, I think. Uh, now, there's a movie called Rashomon, which I actually haven't seen, but it's been described to me. Uh, and I'm told that it's basically about a murder that's told through the eyes of five or seven different eyewitnesses, and they're all totally different accounts of the same events. Uh, if you ask people what happened in Cambridge, uh, here's a subset of the kind of explanations you'll get. I, I, I once was at a meeting with Tip O'Neill uh, when I was working for Governor Dukakis and Lieutenant Governor Tommy O'Neill was there and he says, oh, you remember Fred? He was, you know, active in fighting the inner belt back when his tip says, oh yeah, the inner belt. They wanted to build a road through my district. I said, no, that was it. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> maybe I should have been home with my wife instead of <laughs> Instead of a dentist's house plotting, it was like, you know, I just said, don't do it. It's like the phone call from uh, Saltonstall. Tip says, no, that's it. Didn't seem quite that easy to me. Uh, but there are, every one of these things is accurate. Every one of these things is part of what happened in that process of change. They're all sort of eyewitness accounts, and it could be a much longer list than that. Um, I want to point particularly as someone who teaches urban transportation planning to the 1962 planning requirements. If you think about the timing, the interstate highway system started in 1956, which basically said we'll put a lot of money into building roads. You can get 90 cents on the dollar if you build these roads. And then in 1962, they said, gee, maybe there should be some planning. Uh, my perception of that is that it was a good way of buying off academics. Let's throw some money at planning. It'll keep them yapping and uh, out of harm's way, harm's way being, you know, some of them might do what Lewis Mumford was doing at the time, saying, these are bad ideas, let's not do it. And uh, what was incrementally changing in response to citizen opposition kept getting absorbed by the highway bureaucracy and spun in their direction. Now, my good friend Jeff Mullen is here tonight, and I abuse him all the time, taking out of context. He's got this wonderful quote, uh, which is, culture eats policy for breakfast. And it's, uh, if you haven't lived 
in or close to public agencies, you may not understand what that means. But if you are a public agency whose mission is, I get money from Washington, I build roads, that's the way life should be, that's my job, uh, that's the answer. Now what was the question? And when you put that agency in charge of what's called planning, don't be surprised when you get planning procedures that always say, yeah, we need the other highway. Uh, and it totally turns what one would think about as a rational policy process on its head because it's being run by people who have the answer, who've been told what they're, they're not bad people. They've been told what their job is, and planning is a form of embroidery that goes on top of a predetermined outcome. Uh, so I just wanted to pick that one out <laughs> as a particularly inaccurate explanation of what happened, but some of the other things I think were kind of important. Now, this is a very partial list, and I'm, I just added some names to it. People that are here tonight whose name, I, I apologize, I forgot to put your name on. This is a very partial list of people, everyone whose name is on this, uh, played a significant role, significant enough in many cases that the outcome might have been different if they weren't there. And when you look at the number of names, uh, and the fact that this is a very small subset of the actual list, you understand a little why there is this Rashomon effect. Because if you interviewed all these people, they'd all have still more interpretations of what actually happened. So trying to figure out what happened, partly because we were part of it, but partly and more practically to figure out what to do in the future is complicated when you think about that level of, uh, of participation that was, every one of those names is really essential. Um, so early history and antibodies, I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, there are enough people in the audience almost as old as me who remember what antibodies are. When we were kids, you got measles. The deal was you get measles once. If you survive, your body builds up antibodies. You don't get measles the next time. Bad public policy is like measles. And we had a lot of cases, multiple cases of measles in the Boston area. The West End that Tony talked about was a case of measles. The turnpike was a case of measles. Eventually, people said, the next time come, somebody comes from the government and tells you they're doing you a favor, they're going to take down your house and give you a better one, tell them to go screw themselves. They're lying. They may not even know that they're lying, but it is bullshit. Uh, and enough antibodies in the bloodstream, and they built up over time. And we were lucky that there were enough, and I think that's part of what ultimately happened uh, that gave us a reasonably significant victory against the inner belt. I bolded the bottom three bullets, the Turnpike, the Prudential, and the Turnpike in Cambridge versus Volpe, the Globe, and the MIT professors to capture a moment to illuminate what Tony was talking about. Uh, when um, there was a big fight about the Turnpike, and it was not about the turnpike not going through my, mother, my grandmother's house. Uh, no one cared about my grandmother's house or any of her neighbors. The fight was between then Governor Volpe with his allies in the Boston Globe and in the MIT planning and, and transportation uh, faculty who wanted to build the inner belt using the federal interstate funds and build the turnpike through my grandmother's house, but as far as the BU Bridge and then cutting across Cambridge and going through Roxbury, versus uh, Callahan, who had been czar of transportation for a long time in prior roles. He had done the Central Lottery, uh, very sensitive guy, uh, sort of Boston's version of Robert Moses without the class. Uh, and, uh, but, his, his goal was to build the turnpike straight into South Station. Uh, he won in large part because he connected with the Prudential and they jointly bought out the railroad and there used to be a railroad yard, some of you may remember in the back bay, uh, that the Prudential Center now occupies. So the deal was a package deal uh, the Prudential was the first significant investment in the city since the old, small John Hancock building, the 18-story one or 12-story, whatever it is on, I think it's Clarendon Street. But the Prudential was huge. There hadn't been anything in the city, 
and the turnpike, they were joined at the hip. And I think it's fair to say that's why Callahan won that. Uh, and he had an alliance with Cambridge uh, in the world of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. He didn't want the Interveld built because it was going to take the traffic that he was counting on to finance the turnpike. So you had an alliance of Callahan and some Cambridge officials, uh, and that alliance with Prudential, and that alliance won. And the Globe and uh, the MIT professors uh, and Governor Volpe lost. Having lost that battle, uh, nobody went back and said, well, you know, this has implications for the network. If you looked at the numbers in the 1962 or I think Steve Kaiser corrected me and said 62. it's 60, is it 62 or 65? 62. Okay, in the 1962, Magu Maguire, no, it wasn't Maguire, Maguire, it was, okay. They show traffic projections on the part of the inner belt that goes through Boston, uh, was pro projected to go through Boston over to the Boston City Hospital area, uh, that are very, very low. Quite logical that they're very low because the traffic that would have been on it in the old network was now on the turnpike. It was on a totally redundant line. No one said, well, since the turnpike's built, maybe we don't have to rip all these houses and jobs out of Roxbury. Uh, Logue, who was the head of the BRA at the time, Collins was for the whole system. This was about money. You could get money from the DPW to buy out houses and, and, and job locations, knock them down, uh, and then you'd get the land and you'd get to play your urban renewal game. So this was the, the, the urban land use planners were every bit as bad as the highway builders. I mean, there's a rewritten history that the highway guys were these sort of dorks and, you know, the virtuous planners were in a different place. The planners were totally complicit in this and they had the same paradigm. The, the policy gets eaten by culture for breakfast, of my friend Jeff's observation. They view their job as, I get money from Washington, I buy houses and knock them down, that's good, it's bringing money into the region. They're not checking that they're depleting the housing supply for poor people, uh, that they're driving jobs out of the city in the name of creating new economic development. It's mindless, but that's what was going on, and there was no course correction when Callahan won. Now, I'm not into saying Callahan was a hero. He wasn't, he was a nasty guy. Yeah, he kicked my grandmother out of her house, gave her a buck, and didn't even offer her. I mean, he was a very bad guy. Uh, but the, the good people were just as brutal. Uh, so uh, I wanted to remind a couple of points. Now, early battles. There were a lot of early battles, skirmishes against Rhodes. Most of them lost. The really significant thing was the victory at Memorial Drive that Anstey Benfield, I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, next week. And the London plane trees, someone decided to call them sycamores because that let the, that allowed the acronym to be SOS, Save Our Sycamores. <laughs> and the chief engineer at the MDC, correct me if you remember this differently, Steve, the chief engineer at the MDC says, these people are so ignorant, they're London plane trees. Oh, well, in that case, let's just cut them all down. I mean, it's... So, but the really significant thing is community action, the ladies with the baby carriages, for the first time, won, and the sycamores didn't get cut down, or the London Blaine trees, or whatever we want to call them. The trees are still there. Uh, so that victory really was important in giving people a sense that maybe if you fight, you actually can, can do something. So... Uh, there's a lot of early, you know, I can't make this, there is. So there was a whole phase when there's a municipal coalition versus the state. Uh, and, well, no, I missed this. Okay, there's a phase when it's the neighborhoods versus the city of Cambridge. When Father McManus really started organizing, uh, and when urban, the, the precursor to urban planning aid, and by the way, the Cambridge Committee on the Inner Belt, my recollection is that we changed names once a week. You know, one week it was the Cambridge Committee for Alternatives, and we were fighting with our, amongst ourselves all the time. Wow, we don't like that. So there were several aliases, but Cambridge, the CCIB ended up being what we called ourselves. But the really dramatic thing that happened, because uh, Dennis Blackett was 
getting articles, he had a very rational technique. City Council meets on Monday night still. Let's have something we get on the agenda every Monday. So we're unavoidable. Let's get something into the Cambridge Chronicle. It was very mechanical. Dennis had a really organized plan to get something discussing how bad the inner belt was every week in the Chronicle. And, on, uh, and, and the theme of it was, we've lost the veto. We may think no road at all is the right answer, but it's coming. And we better start talking about alternatives because it's coming right down Brookline Elm. And uh, Father McManus called Dennis and said, gee, I read your article in the newspaper, and you're saying just what I'm saying with my parishioners, but we get outgunned when we go to meetings at the DPW. You know, they're engineers, we're not engineers. You know, would you guys be willing to help us? So all of a sudden, there was a connection between some alleged technical skills that we thought we had. <laughs> maybe we did, maybe we didn't, but we had these MIT degrees that you know, led people to believe we might know what we were talking about. And Father McManus and the community that really had the numbers of people, which really mattered. Uh, but it was a fight within Cambridge. The city planning board was against us. Much of the city council was really annoyed with us. They didn't want to deal with this. It was much more comfortable to say no road at all. That was a safe position, even though everybody knew that meant Brookline L um, was going to get it in the neck. Uh, so that whole period was really important. But there's an aspect of this that I bold and that I wanted to particularly focus on. Uh, I'll do this in reverse order. Logue loses, Kevin White gets elected, Bonnie Frank becomes chief of staff. That turned out to be an enormously important thing for the eventual victory. With the emphasis on Logue losing almost as important as Kevin White uh, winning, because Logue represented the, we'll talk about planning with people, but in the end, that sign that said to hell with urban renewal that uh, Bob was talking about earlier down at the corner of North Harvard Street, those people are going to get bulldozed at the end of the day, just as a good piece of Roxbury got bulldozed. Uh, in the election that Kevin White won, uh, Logue didn't even make the finals. It ended up being Kevin versus Louise Day Hicks. John Sears did better than Logue. Every other candidate was against, took the side of the neighborhoods against the urban renewal, highway building kind of logic that prior Mayor Collins had embraced. So that was an important snapshot of change in the political structure. Uh, Galbraith versus Moynihan and Task A versus Task B, I particularly want to cover. There was a great predecessor to our current great mayor, uh, a fellow named Dan Hayes, who was the mayor, who was uh, very low-key, not at all a grandstander, and I think was, for that reason, allowed to lead the inner belt issue because people trusted that he wasn't in it for himself. And when MIT came out with this ridiculous uh, overreaction uh, that, you know, the man on the moon was going to be late and, you know, we were going to lose the war in Vietnam. We were right about that, but not because of the inner belt. I mean, they, all of this nonsense that came out of MIT, uh, there, there was a meeting that MIT got with Cardinal Cushing. Uh, they got it through a lawyer that represented MIT named Ed Hanafi who was a major fundraiser for Catholic charities. Uh, Cardinal Cushing, God rest his soul, was a big builder. He built a lot of schools, hospitals. He loved to build things. And this guy was raising a lot of money for him. So they get in to see Cushing and say, this road is a real problem for MIT. And they say to Cardinal Cushing, you've got to talk to that priest that priest being Father McManus, who was providing the moral leadership to, to force this issue onto the agenda. And Cushing, staring in the face of the guy that had raised a lot of money for him, said, no, 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 no. You have it wrong. You have to talk to that priest. I mean, Cushing really had guts. He stood up and supported, and he later came out, I think, I don't know if Tony found, came out publicly against the road. Uh, there was a group called 
the Association of Boston Urban Priests, Father Corrigan was part of it, Father Hinckley, a whole bunch of urban priests who wanted to serve in the city that Cushing was supporting. So the church in those years was part of social reform and progress. Uh, but in the aftermath of this ridiculous <coughs> MIT position, a lot of junior faculty, particularly Bob Goodman and Chester Hartman, are the names I remember from MIT and Harvard, respectively, got a big signature drive at Harvard and MIT, something like 500 people saying, this is despicable. Uh, Cambridge is a community. And if this road is bad for MIT, MIT can't sit in its ivory tower and say it's bad for us, end of story. It's got to join the city. If it's bad for MIT, it's bad for the city. Harvard can't stay in back of its walls. It's got to stand up and say, we are part of the city. Uh, and the embarrassment of 500 junior faculty signing this petition created some leverage just when we thought it was curtains. And uh, Mayor Hayes pulled together something called, uh, I think it was the Mayor's Advisory Committee on the Inner Belt. And Father McManus and Mrs. Jackson, uh, a, a black lady from, I think, Riverside, maybe it was uh, Cambridgeport. 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 Right, and she was a secretary later to uh, former Representative uh, Newman, Mary Newman. Uh, and ironically, sat right next to Alan Altshuler's office during the Sajan administration, which was a little interesting. Anyway, Mrs. Jackson and Father McManus were on the committee ceremonially representing the neighborhood, but it was basically a lot of heavy faculty from MIT and Harvard. And uh, the two biggest names were uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan and uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. And we knew that there was a lot of pressure to say no road at all. Uh, that was a comfortable position in Cambridge. It was a comfortable position for the universities to take because they were quite confident that they could say no road at all, but the road was going down Brookline Elm. Father McManus and the group and those of us that were working with them felt it was enormously important that there be two issues on the table. One, should the road be built? And two, if it's to be built, where should it go? Uh, and that if we didn't keep that issue on the table, MIT would be off the hook and it was curtains. That's at least our political analysis. The meeting, key meeting of the Mayor's Advisory Committee was in the second floor of the, uh, the Worst House, which used to be located in Harvard Square. There was a room where they used to have, you know, showers and bar mitzvahs or whatever, you know, it was a little meeting room. Big square room, up on the second floor, steep set of stairs, and we knew that our best hope was Galbraith. And he was flying in from Switzerland, going to be all jet lagged. And Jim Morey uh, and myself, but thank God Jim was there because some of you know I'm somewhat garrulous and can't say good morning in, you know, less than 10 minutes. Uh, Galbraith was huge. He was six foot seven or something. And he's going up the stairs two at a time. And Maury, who was about five seven, is running up the steps next to him. Talk about elevator talk. He had a brief Galbraith on the situation in the space of the first floor to the second floor. Uh, and Galbraith said, I think I got it. I just got off a plane. I think I got it. We sit down. Discussion starts going around the room. It gets to Moynihan. And Moynihan says, well, you know, I've been saying for years these highways are silly and they're bad public policy. We shouldn't be doing them. Uh, so I'm totally in favor of calling for a restudy of whether we need this highway. But as to this question about where it goes, you know, I've been living in this city for some time now, and every two years, the good people get together, and we all work hard, and we try to get a good city council, and we try to get a good school committee so we have good schools and good public services. And every time, those people get more votes than us. And we have bad schools and bad city services. 
And sometimes I think maybe, just maybe, if there were 1,500 less dwelling units of those people, maybe we'd have good city government and good schools. Just astounding. But he was such a skillful talker. I mean, he said it a little more gracefully than I did, but that was absolutely the message. And I'm saying, oh my god, this is bad. I'm sitting near Galbraith. And then it goes to a guy whose name I fortunately forget, who was sitting next to Moynihan. He wanted to be next to the big guy. And he, you know, because they're going around each one articulating their point of view. So he articulates exactly the same point of view as Moynihan. That, ah, you know, we keep losing elections, you know, maybe, you know, 1,500 or even 2,000 less of those dwelling units, you know, that'd be good. Whereupon uh, Galbraith takes his arm, which is six feet long, <laughs> like a laser beam, pointing it totally ambiguously. He could be pointing at Moynihan, he could be pointing at this jerk next to him. Only a moral imbecile would articulate such a point of view. We are living in a country which is tearing itself apart over the subject of race. Across the river, Boston is splitting over the subject of race. Somehow, through some process, none of us is smart enough to understand. There's a working class neighborhood here that is living in reasonable harmony of different ethnic groups, and we're gonna destroy something we don't even understand, something so precious, over a road? That is sick. And I said, oh my God, this guy, <laughs> He hit the ball out of, everybody fell into line. The big question is, is Moynihan going to admit that the finger is pointing at him? And Moynihan goes back and the laser, burn, the laser beam shrivels this little jerk next to him, whose name I fortunately don't remember. And Galbraith carries the day that the consensus is there must be both a task A and a task B. There must be both the study of should the road be built and if it's to be built, where? and that this neighborhood is the wrong place to do it. So that point was, to me, extremely important. And I'm, as usual, talking too long, but I wanted to be sure I got that piece of it in. Uh, it then shifts, as Tony identified. Uh, I would point to the boil, uh, one bullet that's not blackened, which is I-93 in Somerville. Kevin White called for a moratorium on all the highways that were being studied, he was a candidate for governor at the time with Mike Dukakis as his le uh, lieutenant governor, including stopping I-93. Uh, the Globe criticized him for being irresponsible. A month later, Frank Sargent called for a moratorium on everything except I-93. Uh, the Globe said, that's a good compromise. So I-93 got built, elevated through Somerville, as what I would characterize as the last big mistake in this area. Before Sargent later, and I think quite heroically, I, I, I don't mean to be critical of Sargent, who was in a very tough role, but that was the last mistake, and Somerville caught it in the neck. Now, to disagree a little bit with Bob uh, Goodman, uh, we weren't all saying people should be in transit, not in cars. The alliance was really much more based on the enemy of my enemy is my friend. In Somerville, the state had built I-93 to the border of Medford and Somerville, and an interstate highway's worth of traffic was pouring down Mystic Avenue getting onto McGrath Highway. It was excruciating, and people in Sullivan, Somerville said, we can't not have the road. The road's here, and it's at grade running through our neighborhood, but it shouldn't be elevated. It should be depressed like they're promising uh, you know, to give Cambridge. So Somerville's position was, we'll take the road. We actually need the road but just put it below ground. At that point in time, Jamaica Plain was saying the th same thing. We'll take the road, but put it underground. So each neighborhood had a different flavor of what they were saying, some of whom were saying, now everybody said, yeah, I'm for transit, because transit wasn't threatening anybody. But it was much more of an anti-highway coalition than it was a pro-transit coalition. Pro-transit was the convenient thing. There's one other really, the sergeant decision is tremendous. Politicians have a hard time, all of us have a hard time changing our minds. It was extremely courageous for the sergeant to do that. In implementation, the key difference between this being a rebellion that was interesting and then went away, and a revolution that actually changed 
substantive things in terms of what happened afterwards, is that Altshuler did an incredible job after the Sargent decision of working with other states to get the national law changed so that you could use the highway money to build transit. And the ability to get the positive outcome is what made all the difference, I think, in the decision sticking. Sorry for going on too long. Thank you very much. I have much. the terrible job of asking you to stop. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have a question down here. I know you have one up there. Do you want to? Yeah, and I, oh. <laughs> um, I'm Ellen Feingold, and I was working in Cambridge City Hall during all of this time in the Community Development Office um, for Justin Gray. There's one piece of your story which is, you, is left out completely, which is that um, the Cambridge Model Cities was being established at that time. And there was a big issue about where would it be. And one of the things that we decided was we would put it in the way of the inner belt. And we wound up going to HUD and talking to first the regional administrator in New York and then in Washington and prevailing upon them that they would, and told them what we were doing. And they were thrilled. The idea that they would do something constructive against the highways was, from their point of view, a good thing. So in fact, we had a model cities, which was, um, it was another piece of the federal political game that got played at that time. Um, thanks. Uh, first, uh, just a brief amendment to something that was said, because I've spent some time in New Orleans and you know really like it there. Um, they didn't build the highway through the French Quarter. That was a fight that they were successful. But what they did, what they did do, is they built an elevated highway a few blocks away through a black neighborhood, I-10, and now they're finally getting around to you know looking at maybe you know bringing that down. Um, my question is sort of to bring this up to date. Um, today, the T Board of Directors voted four to one to endorse a fare hike and some relatively modest service cuts. Um, Mr. Goodman, you talked about public transportation. Uh, it's implicit in, I think, everything that's being discussed tonight. Um, I, I know there are people here who endorsed a fare hike. I know there are people here who I saw at the DOT meeting. There was a rally that's still going on tonight at the State House about this. I would be interested in hearing the views of all of you very experienced people uh, about where we are right now with, I, I know we're not going to get it all solved tonight, but just some of your thoughts about the situation we currently find ourselves in uh, with the MBTA and these fare hikes. Uh, it's a long topic. I'll try to be much briefer than I normally am. Uh, the debt problem at the T is a direct result of the so-called forward funding uh, legislation uh, back around 2000. It's complicated gobbledygook, but basically the T got loaded up with a lot of debt. Uh, and the 1964 MBTA Enabling Act provided was intended to be a growth machine for public transportation to grow in order to let the city grow with more public transportation and less cars. And it provided that the state would pay 90% of the debt service on capital for expanded transit service. Uh, Governor Sargent made further adjustments to the MBTA statute when Alan Altshula was secretary to provide that the state would pay half of the operating subsidy of transit, uh, recognizing that the cost of transit grows at faster than the rate of inflation, particularly for services like commuter rail and the ride. Uh, and that it, if we were going to allow transit to grow as we needed it to for the economy and for the new vision that Governor Sargent embraced and Alan Altshuler implemented incredibly successfully, you needed a financial instrument to allow that to happen. 
uh, largely Finneran, uh, with a big assist from Senator McGovern from outside the district, insisted on the so-called forward funding. And what they did is they put the T on a flat revenue stream when the operating subsidy grows by faster than the rate of inflation. It was absolute certainty locked into place with that statute that this kind of explosion would have now. They did two things. They locked it into this flat growth, and they dumped all this debt on it. What do we do now? The state should take the debt back. The T entered that debt uh, under a statute that said the, Fed, that the state was going to pay 90% of the debt service. So the T was the entity issuing the debt, but it was under a clear, totally public state policy that the state was paying the carrying cost. Finneran dumped that all back on the T, but he didn't do it alone. A lot of people you know, were complicit in the thing, and now it's exploding. When you say, what are you going to do about it, the state should take the debt back. Uh, but it's very hard, if you were a representative in Western Mass with a lousy economy, uh, and you look at the situation and say, Eastern Mass has a reasonably decent economy in comparison to us, and they got a lot of unpaid bills from the big dig. I love the big dig. You may know that. A lot, of, a lot of unpaid bills from the big dig, a lot of unpaid bills from MBTA expansion, and we're supposed to pay a higher gas tax for them. That is not going to happen. So what can happen? The biggest single beneficiary of the big dig, uh, which was supposed to be a 90-10 job, but ended up with roughly 60% federal and the rest of it on the state. That's the source of a big chunk of the debt. The biggest beneficiary of the big dig, by a none, is the Massachusetts Port Authority. Over half of the big dig, the Seaport Access Road and the 10 Williams Tunnel, go to the Seaport, Massport, South Boston Real Estate Holdings, and Logan Airport. That's where the money went. That's half the cost of the big dig, more than $7 billion, went to stuff that Massport wanted. And they're primarily the beneficiary of that. They're hiding in terms of paying for any of it. The garages at Massport are an excuse to print money. They only exist because of the access provided by the Callahan Tunnel and the Ted Williams Tunnel. Uh, without getting into a fight with the airlines, I mean, I'd love to see the airlines pay something, but that's a different fight we might not win. But the garages, which are the biggest source of money that's not airfield, Massport should be paying over $100 million a year in debt service to Mass DOT and taking that off the back of the T. That would ease the T problem. There's still other problems that have to be dealt with, but if you had a Boston institution, Massport, stepping up to the plate and taking responsibility, then it might be feasible for an elected official from Springfield or North Adams to participate in a vote to do something. It could be the gas tax, it could be something else. Transportation will need more money and it will have to come from the state. But the state's never gonna do it. And Governor Patrick has the votes at the Massport board. You know, you know, getting a statute through is tough. Getting a vote through the Massport board when he's appointed five out of the seven people, that's not tough. There's no excuse for not doing it. That's the quick solution. It's not a full solution but it would substantially ease the rest of the problem that's been left on the table. These fair hikes are awfully big, but there's fair hikes at least as big coming next year if something doesn't happen. A Massport move could stabilize the T and create the possibility for the state to step up to the plate and deal with the rest of the debt. I'm intimidated to go after that. Um, this, this is about going back to history. Uh, I actually live in Anstey Benfield's house because uh, right on the thruway, right? And, um, but at that period of time, as the communities were beginning to mobilize, there was a lot else besides the highway that was going on. This was the culmination of the civil rights movement. There was a pretty active anti-war movement, women's movement. How did any of those larger movements play into what became possible in terms of fighting, if only as a threat, in terms of fighting against the, uh, the highways? Wait. Who would like to answer that question? Uh, oh, oh, 
everybody wants to answer. I'll be happy to answer. Do you want to answer it, Tony? Oh, Tony didn't answer one yet. Tip Tony. I, I certainly think that uh, all those movements and um, were part of the atmosphere that made it possible for the um, um, anti-highway movement to move. It influenced certainly all of us. As um, I think, one thing I didn't mention was that as the group of people who who um, started this were a different generation of. Planners. I mean, we were people who had actually lived in the housing, or the kind of housing that's going to be destroyed. We lived in the kind of neighborhoods that was actually being destroyed, and um, and also had firsthand uh, on the, all the other issues of empowering people. So I think all of those were part of the um, um, the you know the the atmosphere in which this took place. And I th also I think for the national as well, because Lyndon Johnson was in, um, in you know, 1967, uh, the, um, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, the, um, the convention, um, you know, those are all happening in the background with a, a highway that's gonna destroy 15, 1,300 housing units, I mean, uh, 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 households. So I think, yeah, absolutely, that was part of the context. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I'd make two other observations. One is that many of us who were involved in the anti-war movement uh, who happened to be in physical design, I know I made my own calculation that to march on Washington and be the 500,000th and first person or miss it didn't seem like a significant contribution, but on issues like this, I could actually use my MIT degree, because people thought it meant something, uh, to help in a tangible way locally. So to me, it was frustration that there was only so much you could do on the national issues, and this was a way of acting locally uh, in a way that would build consciousness. I, I was part of the Hughes campaign. Some of you may remember the H. Stewart Hughes. Uh, we had an organizing committee. I went into the headquarters in Harvard Square to volunteer. They said, oh, you got an Italian name. You got the North End. I said, I'm not from the North End. I don't know anybody there. It's okay. You're the only Italian that came in. They gave me some index cards. Uh, the Murrays, by the way, some of you know Janet, uh, uh, th th they were living in the North End. They were on the original committee. We had five Hayes Hughes volunteers. We had a wonderful coffee at the Cafe Paradiso and an opera singer, and Hughes spoke in Italian. It was wonderful. Hundreds of people there. When the votes were counted, we got three votes. We didn't even get our five people to the polls. <laughs> but, you know, the conclusion was our neighbors in the North End aren't stupid. They know it's their kids getting shipped off to Vietnam. Uh, so it's not that they are paying a much bigger price than the middle class for this horrible war. It's that they don't believe that they can affect a ramp down the street that's threatening to take what was then Martin Yetis. So they have no belief that political action can change the war. 